Thank you all. So our world is changing fast, and um, I'll share a story since we're on the topic of stories um, that probably many of us can relate to. The other day I was at the bank, and I was talking to a couple of the tellers, and they were telling me how much they didn't like math. And uh, that's common. We hear that a lot. And yet they were calculating how much my change was going to be. <laughs> and, uh, and so I asked them, I said, well, does it make sense here? And they said, well, yeah, I'm at, I'm at a bank. It makes sense here. And sometimes it's that connection or lack thereof that causes the gap, right? And oftentimes, because of this changing world we live in, we live in a world where there's so much going on with technology, and we live in a busy world, there's all kinds of things happening simultaneously, it often can probably feel to students a little bit like this. Well, let's line up and sit in our rows and all wear the same tie. <laughs> and so that's one thing that, that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we stay connected? to the, how do we connect an educational experience to the outside world, if you will. For example, if I go and grab my smartphone out of my pocket, could I connect to just about anything I want to? I can connect to information everywhere. I can connect with people through social networking. I can connect at so many levels to the world, to information around us. And yet, when we go into a classroom, Though there are a lot of innovative practices happening, and there's a lot that ties in technology and group-based learning and, and whatnot, there's still, it, it still is a different environment. We're still going to another place. So we have to ask ourselves that ongoing question. How do we stay connected, and how do we connect education to a changing world? So that first picture of the classroom I showed you looks somewhat different than this, obviously, but really the structure is much the same. There's students sitting in rows looking at the front, right? So in a world that is changing so quickly, is this environment the environment that connects us to the most ideal learning experience? And again, I won't pose necessarily an answer to that question, but just the question itself. Let's think about the student. So if, let's take a student situation right now. Um, probably many of you who are students in the room are working one, maybe two jobs sometimes three. Um, we know students who are working a lot. In addition, it's money's tighter these days. Um, it's harder to make enough money to not only pay for school, but to pay for everything else. There are burdens that exist for the student. And the student carries those burdens both metaphorically and physically in that backpack, right? Um, the, some of the burden has to do with simply the cost of educational materials. Um, I'm sure that I could look around to many of you in this room who are students and you would relate to me that books are expensive. It costs a, quite a good amount of money to be able to pay for the supplies for your education. In fact, in the community colleges, textbooks alone can represent sometimes up to 50% of the cost of the entire course. That's a big number. So it leads us to a problem. Because now you have to ask, are students buying the books and paying the financial price, or are they not buying the books and paying the price of learning? No matter how you look at it, there's a cost to be paid. And in addition to that, you've got uh, the fact that other educational systems aren't any cheaper. Imagine that a student goes to a community college, right? pay you know, a, a reasonable amount of money for a course, and then goes to a UC, Cal State, or Harvard, Stanford, some other university, there is a lot of cost associated with that. The burden gets larger and larger. So what is it that students often need to get in order to be able to afford school? They need to get loans, right? So you see this starting to pile up. There are pressures that exist that can lead to a changing system. This is what happens in the end. I don't know if you've had this happen before. Probably everyone in this room has had that unfortunate moment where you open your wallet and find nothing left. Sometimes there's a piece of plastic in there, but that takes you back into the negative, right? The burdens have stacked up to the point where education is so costly 
that it uh, forces us really to stop and ask some very important questions about how education will continue in the society and how students will be able to afford it. Because that is a real, real question. But here's the exciting thing. This may sound daunting, this may sound negative, but it actually opens opportunities. It actually opens pathways. Because with technology and with the connected nature of information, we can now take this to the next level and start thinking about how we can utilize those tools to pull us together in a more sustainable way. Some of you may recall that people used to buy music in buildings. <laughs> um, that, that used to happen. I used to go to Tower Records, not this one, and, and pay, for, uh, pay for CDs or, you know, even before that, tapes. Um, goodness. Um, so, so I used to pay for music in these buildings, and now I go on to iTunes. I go on to Amazon MP3 or, you know, go on to somewhere online and, and pay for music that way and download music and books and other media, right? This seemed like a very sustainable model. I couldn't think when I was younger of any reason why this would close down, and yet it did. Now, let me be careful and say I'm not arguing that schools will close down. Far from it. However, I am arguing that we do need to think about the pressures that exist outside and how they can have an impact on the way that school exists for all of us. One of the things that can change, that can lead to a very significant positive effect for students is something called open educational resources. And this is a movement that I've been involved with for some time now. Open educational resources are online digital learning resources that are openly licensed, which means they're licensed to be shared freely. Anybody can have access to them. You don't need to pay for them. You don't need to get permission, anything. So open educational resources allow for the possibility that that textbook cost goes to zero. That is, a, I think, a big plus, right? That changes the game. Now, of course, there are some barriers because open educational resources require somebody to make them, right? Um, textbook companies, for example, spend inordinate amounts of money to hire the experts, hire designers, hire all the teams of people that are going to put these materials together and make them solid and make them really, really good. And then instructors can adopt those textbooks. Does the instructor pay for the textbook? No. Who pays for the textbook? The student, right? I don't blame the instructors. I'm one myself. I do the same thing many times. The issue is, instead is this. It is too difficult many times for me or for another instructor to take the time to write a book on top of teaching classes and all of that. So there still are things that have to change. There still is a fight. There still is a pressure that exists between the publishing industry and this new movement. But here's where the fight gets fair. The fight was so unfair for so long. But now the fight is fair because our, our federal government, state government, and other national governments are pouring money into the open educational resources effort. In fact, there's legislation on the table in the state of California that would pay for the design of free open textbooks for some of the most common enrolled courses in community colleges and universities. If that legislation goes through, that's state-funded development of textbooks that, guess what, any of you can use for free. So if this movement gains steam, this fight starts to get pretty interesting, right? Now, one has the upper hand the one carrying no, the, the price of free, right? That one takes down the costly price. So it's something to consider that can change the game somewhat. Now, this is something that's important to look at when it comes to content. Now, here's, here's a big plus about this content. Open educational resources create, help to shape the real connectedness, the real global classroom. Imagine, right now, is, would you say it's easier for uh, somebody in the United States to afford a textbook compared to, let's say, somebody in um, Vietnam? Based on the economic structures, probably so. Open educational resources are free. So that means anybody in the world can afford them. Does that allow us to connect information much more effectively across the world to everybody? Absolutely it does at a price of free. That's just content. 
What about practice? What about experience? I don't know how many of you have heard this term, MOOC. I shouted it here, MOOC. MOOC. Um, this stands for Massive Open Online Course. And a Massive Open Online Course is essentially a course, an online course, that is typically free. I'm going to underline that word again. Typically free. Often created by large universities like Stanford, Harvard, MIT, esteemed organizations at a price of free, like I said, that contain typically thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of students in one class. Now, this is not the solution, right? Because if I'm a student with 900, or let's say 99,999 other students in the class, am I likely to get much attention from my instructor? They aren't even going to know I'm there, right? So it's not the same dynamic, and it certainly doesn't work for everybody. But it's an interesting change because it is free. What, do you, what does a student get at the end of taking a MOOC? At this point, typically some sort of certificate. In fact, Harvard and MIT and others issue a certificate of completion. It's not a degree, but it's a certificate of completion. So it's an indication of a possibility, right? Does this solve everything? No. But it's an indication of change. What does a MOOC do, though? It allows for you to take a course with somebody who is in Spain and somebody else who's in Japan, and somebody else who's in South Africa. The entire world now is contained within a course, rather than students at a given institution. That's pretty exciting, right? And there's a lot of chances for interaction, communication, and interfacing globally. Talk about connectivity, right? This truly connects the learning experience across the world. And it's not just me looking up something on Google on my phone. That's just information. That's just that's all that is. But a course and open educational resources are information that's been packaged in such a way to teach. Now, of course, that's still minus the teacher and the interaction. There's still a lot of problems with this model. But does it at least plant that seed in your head that things could change? One thing does lead to another, folks. Just because the MOOC may not answer all of our educational questions about how the new society and the new world allows for students to be educated. It may not answer all of those. But does it plant the seed? Does the MOOC allow for other things to possibly happen down the road? And that leads us to imagine. So I'm going to leave. This is actually my very last slide. But I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this because I want to paint a real picture for you. And then I'm going to carefully walk off the stage and leave you to think. Here's what I want you to think about. Consider this, if you will. Um, how many of you have heard of the term artificial intelligence? Okay, almost everybody. Artificial intelligence allows for a computer to process thought in a much more similar way to how humans do. So I want you to imagine that MOOC experience I was talking about. But imagine artificial intelligence tied into that. Imagine that the computer inside the course can say, welcome back, John. Last week I saw you struggled with this and this and this. I'm going to assign a lesson plan that's going to be based on these five things that you need to learn, and here you go. It's not the instructor talking to me. It is a computer that's not as good as a person. But there's one big thing that you need to stop and think about, that you need to think about all day, <laughs> and that is this. Even though that computer is not a person, that computer's done one thing that I as an instructor cannot do. That computer has individualized my instruction. That computer has individualized my pathway. It is completely customized around me. This is a force that exists around us. This is something that we have to be aware of. This is something that leads us to want to have an ongoing conversation. I hope that you continue that ongoing conversation, and I look forward to speaking with some of you at a later time. Thank you. Thank you.